morning. It's Jeffrey Christian from CPM Group. Uh, it's about 8.33 in the morning on Friday, the 4th of March uh, here in New York. I'm going to talk to you about hedging for producers and it applies to other companies too uh, today. Um, let me see if I can do this. On January 14th, we did a, a video called Hedging uh, for Investors. And we talked a little bit about basics about hedging. Going to go into more details about the basics of hedging. And we said we followed that up with another one, which was staying long and hedging, how an investor can hedge their long position, take advantage of short-term price moves up and down while staying long. We had said that we were going to talk about hedging for producers, uh, but the exigencies of the market and the war in the Ukraine uh, and other things have kept us from doing that until today. We're going to do it today. It's a very complicated subject, and this video is going to go long. Stay with it throughout the end because there's a whole lot of information that is simply not known in the market. There's a lot of misrepresentation of hedging in the market. Some of it has been consciously spread. Some of it is simply not known. Hedging is like gold. It's something that a lot of people who don't really understand it feel free to opine about it. Um, going to cut through that. We're going to talk about basics of hedging, and we have a whole series of examples of hedging done right and hedging done poorly. Uh, naming company names, naming a couple other people too. So stick with it because it'll be worth it. I'll try to go fast. I used this slide back in January. Hedging options are financial dynamite. If you know how to use them, you can build bridges, skyscrapers, civilizations. If you don't know how to use it, you'll probably blow your head off. We've seen those examples, and that is true. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples of both today. Now, hedging came to be seen as bad in the mid-1990s. Mid-1990s was a period of time when gold prices were basically trading between $320 and $380 an ounce, uh, and more often between $340 and $360. Uh, stock market was doing well. Bond prices were going from Bond interest rates were going from 7% to, to like 2 or 3%. Uh, the bond market was doing well. We had a surge in productivity. Deregulation, globalization, computerization was really goosing the economy. Uh, the dollar was very strong for periods of time. The Deutsche Mark was strong for periods of time. There were any number of reasons why investors were not investing in gold. And in that environment, there was a company called Mercury Asset Management, which was ultimately bought by Merrill Lynch, which was ultimately bought by Bank of America. And Mercury Asset Management had this fellow, Julian Baring, who was a gold mining investor, share investor, and he ran a gold fund for Mercury Asset Management. And he was upset because the gold price wasn't rising. He was one of those guys who doesn't pay attention to reality, but says, hey, gold prices should be rising. Clearly something's wrong here. And he bought the Kool-Aid that was being perpetrated by the World Gold Council, that the gold price wasn't being held down by a lack of investment demand, which is what CPM Group was saying, but rather because in, uh, producers were selling forward. It's nonsense. I won't bore you with the details as to the, why the World Gold Council did it, uh, promoted that view, but it has become a view. And you'll see that people who work with the World Gold Council still talk about forward uh, sales as somehow or other being physical spot supply, depressing the price of gold. It has nothing to do with reality and it's totally uh, Ill, uh, not right. But Julian, proper Britishman that, uh, that he was, bought it. And he started a witch hunt against hedging. These companies that are hedging are keeping the price from rising and therefore we as investors should not invest in them. Now, if you go and look at the relationship between gold mining company stocks and whether or not they hedge, prior to Julian Baring starting this witch hunt, there was no correlation. Peter Tufano was a professor at MIT, then he went over to England, I think he was at Oxford, uh, he may still be there, fabulous, uh, econ economist and financial analyst had done a lot of work and he showed it didn't affect the share price of mining companies whether or not they hedged. But 
companies that hedged had better operating performance. They did better as a company, right? After Mercury started its witch hunt, you saw that the company still outperformed non-hedgers, but in the equity market, they underperformed because the witch hunt was taking money out of the shares price of hedgers and putting it with non-hedgers. Julian retired, he was replaced by Graham Bell, uh, Graham Birch. Um, Graham continued the witch hunt. In 2002, Euro Money had a gold conference in London and we were on a panel together and we were talking about it. And I mentioned Mark Ladies, who was one of the team that did hedging at Amex Gold. And I'll tell you about Amex Gold in the past, uh, later in this presentation, because they beat the market by 47% by virtue of their hedging book. They knew what they were doing. They were excellent people. They were good clients of CPM Group. They're good friends of CPM Group still. Um, Graham said, yes, the problem with hedging is Mark Ladies. If every company had a Mark Ladies as its treasurer or its CFO, I would be pro hedging. The reality is that most companies don't have Mark Ladies and they're very rare. And so they do hedging poorly and therefore they ought not to hedge. That tells you everything you need to know about why companies don't hedge. Okay, what could have been done last week with a hedge? This is a hedge that we structured on the 22nd of February, before the invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, the gold price was 1875, long time ago. 1875, uh, you could lock in, a, I'm sorry, that wasn't the gold price. I'm not quite sure where the gold price was at that time, but it was 1900 or 1890 or something like that. You could lock in 1875, 1825, 1825 as a floor price, and you could give up $50 if the price went over 2075. So you would have, if you were a producer and you'd put this hedge in place, you would have a guaranteed price of 1825, which is pretty close to record prices, uh, far higher than, than prices have been for most of the last 10 years uh, and, and forever. Uh, from 1825 to 2025, which would be close to the intraday record, you would get the market. From 2025 to 2075, you'd get 2025. And over 2075, you would get the market less $50. You'd pay no premium up front. You have a contingent premium, which is that $50 if the price goes to record levels. And if you think about it, $50 is a transaction cost for gold. The minute maximum credit exposure, which comes in very important, and I'll give you an example from Newmont later, <clears throat> was about $50. Two days later, after the invasion, the gold price had shot up and you could lock in 1875 and give up the same $50. So that's the power of hedging done right. Now, what is hedging? Hedging, let's see if I can do this here. Uh, I have to be able to do this. Uh, hedging with futures or forwards. You lock in a price. The green line is, I'm just going to lock in this price. You protect yourself from adverse price developments, i.e. falling prices, but you give up all of the upside. With a collar, which I'll show you later, you can get a little bit of the upside, but you give up most of it. It's an extremely inefficient way of hedging. And once we had commodity options legalized in the United States, uh, 1984, 1985, then all of a sudden um, we started seeing this go again. Hedging with futures and forward. CPM Group uses a compound option program, like I just showed you in the previous thing, where you protect yourself from adverse price effects and you keep most of the upside. Give up that $50 in the examples from last week that I showed you. The World Bank called CPM Group's uh, strategy probably the most effective uh, commodity price risk management uh, strategy in existence. We haven't found one better. So that's what you do. Very quickly, if you're selling spot, 
price goes down, you get lower prices, price goes up, you get higher prices. Not really managing your position. Forwards, you give up all the upside. Simple put options, you can keep that upside, but those puts cost money. An option, a lot of uh, dealers will do this. Producer says, I don't want to sell forward. Oh, well, good, give you a collar. And what you get is a little bit of the upside. Let's see if this works. It should work. Um, you get that minimum price received. The producers, the producers get a little bit of the upside. Um, a collar today would give you maybe $50 of the upside. Uh, and let's see here. The banks get the rest. This is one of the reasons why banks don't like us. I know there are people on the internet in their mother's basements and whatnot, uh, and some of them say they don't actually live in their mother's basements. I guess they live on the ground floor, um, who say that we're in cahoots with the banks. The reality is banks don't like us. Banks don't like us for a variety of reasons. And one of them is that what we do is we take this dynamic hey, I'm a bank, you want to hedge, I'll give you another $20, another $50 through a collar, and I'm going to keep the rest of the blue sky up, upward uh, motion. Participatory option, you change that. The same kind of return here, but with a participatory option, you get most of the upside. Now let's see if we can do this. And you give that little sliver to the bank. So now you know why banks don't like us so much. You get the floor price that you want, you keep most of the upside, and you basically turn the table on your bankers. That's what we do. In the mid 1990s, Freeport McMoran got worried because the price of copper was showing weakness. Uh, a investment bank, which will remain nameless, had proposed to them, they said, we think we want to hedge uh, our, uh, a year's worth of copper. Uh, the bankers proposed that they buy puts, just buy puts. And it would cost you, I think the number for some reason sticks in my mind that it was $27 million in put premium. CPM Group was working for Freeport Macaran doing a variety of things. And they asked us about this and we showed them how to pay for that put with a call spread, no premium, and the exact same price exposure. You can lock in the price. If the price rises, you'll give up a little bit on that contingent premium, and you don't pay any premium up front. That's the power of hedging done effectively. Producers receive above market prices over time. It's like playing poker where you can lose a dollar a hand, but you can win, your pot that you can win is open-ended. You can lose in petroleum. It's quite common that you'll see a company that does this and they lose more often than they win, but they lose a dollar a barrel when they lose. And when they win, they can win last week, $10 a barrel. So over time you beat the market, even if you don't beat it on each individual hedge, uh, you protect your operations from sharp declines in prices and you preserve the ability to benefit from hot rising prices. Really smart stuff. Executives at mining companies are hired to manage the company. Part of management includes protecting against risks, including risks that are beyond the control of the company, like the price of their products, copper, gold, silver, whatever it is. Management can't control market prices, but they can control the price they receive for their products through hedging. And management at a publicly traded company has a fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders to manage those risks. As Graham Birch said, if every company could have a Mark Ladies, I would be pro hedging. Yeah, we miss Mark, he's retired. Why mining companies don't hedge? They don't really understand this. When they say, I think I should hedge, they go to their trading counterpart, their bank, their investment bank, their trading company, and they say, what's a good hedge? And the hedging service providers, generally speaking, say, well, here's a good hedge for me. <laughs> forward, a fixed forward is fabulous. A collar is fabulous. 
and the mining company doesn't necessarily have the knowledge base to counter bid and say, no, I don't want to do that. How about, you know, I buy a put and pay for it with a call spread. Because the hedging service providers traditionally don't give you good hedges, you have bad performance, hedges that don't protect your price, hedges that uh, blow up in your face. And that then turns off producers from hedging. Um, financial managers, the CFO, the treasurer, the sales department will never be penalized if the price of gold falls below their cost of production and the company suffers or goes bankrupt or gets taken over by a company that's hedged. Peter Monk, uh, they will get penalized if they try to hedge and the hedge goes wrong. Peter Monk, who created Barrick, was asked, how is it that Barrick became such a large and powerful company under your guidance from 1983 through 2000, 2002? Uh, while about 27 other companies came and went. And he said, they didn't hedge. They believed in gold. I don't believe in gold, I hedge. When the price would go up, I would put a hedge in place. They would borrow as much money as the banks would lend them and then go buy things at over other gold deposits and mining company pro projects at inflated prices. And then when the price came down, they would have a financial crisis and Barrick would buy them. studies. I've got some good ones. Homestake Mining, of course, uh, strange. Amex Gold, uh, Barrick, Ashanti, prior to 1993. And then I've got some failures. Let's run through them. Positive case study. Homestake was the first classic adamantly opposed to hedging mining company. Homestake was a fabulous company. I think I've mentioned before, their South Dakota mine was started in the 1880s was closed around 2005 or so, never had more than eight or 10 years worth of mine reserves, uh, but was the biggest, and for a while probably the only, US gold mine in operation. During the depression, Homestake paid monthly dividends because it was in such a great shape. It never hedged. In April of 1997, just before the gold price fell from 340 to $270, CPM Group demonstrated its hedging strategy to Homestake Mining. The board passed a resolution allowing the company to hedge. We structured a hedge, they placed it, and they locked in $325 an ounce for 900,000 ounces of gold to uh, sales for in 1998 giving up $10 of the upside at the time. The gold price averaged $295 in 1998. They made $29.70 or $26.7 million on that. They could have made even more, but they used an investment bank to do this, which, and they didn't really uh, pay attention to directions. And, and they gave the bank a lot more than they needed to give for it. But here's a company never hedged adamantly anti-hedging, took a look at our strategy, put on a hedge, and earned $26 million in one year. Eric has taken a lot of flack for the losses it had in its hedges after 2000, 2005. Barrick has lost a lot of money, but if you go back to the original management, Peter Monk and others, from 1983 to 2000, Barrick earned approximately $3 billion on its hedge program. It spent about $2 billion building and buying gold mines, and it earned about $2 billion selling gold. So its gold mining operations pretty much broke even, but it earned $3 billion, was the largest mining company in the world at the time, and was extremely profitable due to its hedging operations. Here, the original management that understood hedging better than anybody else in the business, except maybe Mark Ladies, uh, left. The company decided that it was, its share price was suffering because of the witch hunt. Uh, so it decided new management came in and decided to unwind those hedges. 
didn't quite unwind them well and lost a lot of money unwinding those hedges. Amex Gold, as I mentioned earlier, they beat the market by 47% or $160 in the late 1980s and 1990s. The price of gold, I think, was probably around $340 on, on average during this period of time. And they earned approximately $500 an ounce by selling their gold on a hedged basis. And actually, they pretty much sold their gold in one physical transaction and hedged on financial transactions that were separate from the actual sales. But they earned $500 an ounce in a time when the price was $340 an ounce. They really knew what they were doing. Shanty gold fields in Ghana started rehabilitating its mines around 1990. Well, actually earlier than that, closer to 1981 or 80. <clears throat> and we were working with them. Part of the rehabilitation was that they started hedging using our strategy. And at the time, you would give up $10 of any upside. They did very well. And the, prob the, pro the, the, the program was really good. They could only have, they only had credit to do this for like one to three years. So the International Finance Corp came along and created the first ever enhanced credit facility, standing behind a shanty to allow it to hedge more gold with AAA rated banks. Now, there was a problem. As soon as the IFC enhanced credit facility came along, non-banks came along and said, well, if you've got the IFC behind you, even though we can't plug into the enhanced credit facility, we will trade with you and we will sell you hedges. And they sold them all kinds of garbage, which cost them money. And I'll talk about that in the loss. But from 1988 to 1993, at least, they were doing extremely well, rebuilding the Gold Coast of Africa, which had fallen into uh, disrepair. In 1980, they were flying in engineers and, and geologists from Lagos because Ghana wasn't gr too great of a place to be. By 1990, people in the oil industry in Nigeria were flying in people from Ghana because it had turned itself around so well with the rehabilitation of perhaps its largest uh, producer. Negative case study. A shanty, when it blew up in 1999, had 5,000 individual hedges in totally 19 million ounces, roughly eight years of production. All these non-bank facilities and some of the banks too, came in and were just selling them all kinds of stuff. Things, I won't bore you with the details, knock in, knock outs. We call them casino hedges. In some cases, they weren't even giving you price protection. And Ashanti wasn't really keeping track of it all. They just kept buying these things. They didn't realize until price spiked up for two weeks and they had a credit issue, they didn't even realize that they had 5,000 individual hedges totaling 19 million ounces. They didn't really see it and it blew up in their face. They, if they had continued to use only our strategy, those 19 million ounces would have had a credit risk of $190 million. They had about, what, $300 million credit line at the time? So they would have escaped unscathed. Instead, they had losses around $600 million. They had to sell a bunch of their, a big portion of their shares uh, at uh, fire sale basement prices. And ultimately, they were taken over by Anglo Gold. I will say this at the same time that they had this problem with their hedge book, Barrick actually had a really good hedge book and beat the market by a wide margin. July 1999, uh, CPM structured a gold hedge for them. We had a floor price of $250 for 2000 uh, for the period uh, for 2000 and slightly higher for like two subsequent years, giving up $12 of the upside. The gold price was $254.50 at the time. Numa instead took the advice of an unnamed investment bank. Again, it's very funny that people criticize me for things not knowing what the relationships really are. Uh, and they bought from that counterpart three years of puts, 2.85 million ounces, 
at $250 and paid for them with a bullet call three years out. So a long dated call. Over the course of the ensuing three years, the price of gold was above 250. So those puts expired worthless. But then the price rose and it rose above the $270 that that bullet call had. The calls were a massive credit liability on the company. The company first converted them to uh, rolling forwards, deferring it until such time as the price fell below $270. And anybody can look at a gold price chart now and see that was a bad decision because the price never fell below $270. Uh, and ultimately, several years later, they had to buy back those rolling forwards. The total costs, I believe, were about $585 million to get out of that hedge. And that hedge had basically grown so large as a, as a contingent liability that Newmont was having issues with its uh, credit availability. Hedging done poorly. Oh, you know, this is one of the greatest investment banks in the world. They wouldn't lie to me. PRD Gold is an interesting company, South Africa, and they had about 1 million ounce hedge 2000, 2001. Uh, they decided to buy it back. And they said that they, they closed out their hedges, uh, they had to pay $110 million. Closing out the hedges would have cost about $15 million if you do the calculations. When we asked, hey, how, how did a $15 million unwind cost $110 million? They said, oh, it was legal fees. Sons of Gualia, similar situation, both in gold and in zinc, I believe, uh, was another one. And they basically grossly overhedged and they had puts, and then they had puts that they converted into forwards, uh, and then they had forward contracts. And they had several years worth of production there, 9.4 9 years worth of production hedged, uh, and they didn't have, a, they, they had this massive contingent liability. So they're no longer around. Pazminko was the company in Australia that did zinc, the same sort of thing. Uh, there are other companies that have had problems in the market, but they're not hedging. Fidelco wasn't really a hedge. There was a guy who was selling and he was also doing hedging and he was not supervised. And he had taken on some speculative positions that no one else in the company knew about. The speculative positions went wrong. He was losing money, so he doubled up and then he tripled up and then he quadrupled up. And he had this massive uh, position that was at a loss in copper. Sumitomo, virtually the exact same thing with a trader named Hamanaka, very famous. And then Minpeko in 1979 was selling forward uh, and was doing very well as the price of silver rose. So they stopped hedging and they started speculating and they started selling all kinds of silver forward. And then the price came down and they were caught like that. About our hedging facilities on our website, we have various documents. You can study this video. We have a presentation on our hedging services also on our website. You can learn about them. In it, you can buy our reports. You can hire us as advisors for hedging, for other things to understand the market. One of the reasons I'm doing this video today is for posterity. One of the reasons why we I agreed to do this series of videos a couple of years ago was to use them as a brain dump. There's a lot of information and a lot of history that we have that people simply don't have. Um, and so this video hopefully will preserve some of this information. We also take sponsorships. We have our gold yearbook, which will be released in early April, our silver yearbook in early May, and the platinum yearbook in uh, late June. All of them, we take sponsors. You can see that on the cover. Uh, producers, refiners, companies, uh, exchanges, companies that are involved in uh, using the metals, uh, companies that are involved in wholesale and retail investment products, uh, a wide range of companies. Unlike some companies that are involved with institutions that only comprise producers who would like to see higher prices. CPM Group works very hard 
to have a client base, most of which is confidential at the client's discretion, uh, but the sponsorships obviously show up on the reports. He worked very hard to have a clientele spread throughout the industry. We have mining companies, smelters, refiners, industrial users. We have institutional investors. Most of our business is in fact with institutional investors and high net worth individuals and family offices. We do very little with sell side financial institutions. Less than 1% of our revenue comes from sell side financial institutions. As I said, they don't necessarily like us. They hate it when they're talking to a producer or a consumer about hedging and we show up as advisors to their counterpart because they know what we're going to advise. We've had one bank in London when we were working with a platinum producer in the 1990s and we showed up with the producer's executives to talk about a financing and the bank said, Mr. Christian can't come in. We won't allow him. And they said, okay, well then we're not gonna work with you. We went to another bank, uh, actually Rothschild, and we sat down and the CEO said, so what are you gonna require us in terms of hedging? And the head of trading said, we're going to ask Jeff what you wanna do, and then we'll let you know if we can do it. They got the business. Um, so you can be a sponsor of our yearbooks, you can be a client, you can be an uh, we can advise you on a range of topics, we're there. Uh, I think I've probably gone a long time on this, but it's a very complicated subject that is full of misunderstanding and misinformation and people who have economic value in spreading that misinformation. So we'll probably take a lot of flack from people who just don't want to believe what's in front of them, uh, but we're used to that. Have a good day. It's Friday. Have a good weekend. We'll talk to you next week.